So just a brief disclaimer here, I want to make it very clear that I've never done a level 3 qualification before and I've never done an access course either, so what I'm doing here could very well be wrong but I'm just preparing the best I can with the information that I have. So for those of you that are new here, hi, I'm James, and I'm hoping to take an Access to Medicine course in September to get into medicine later on next year. And for those of you who aren't aware, an Access course is basically just a nine month level three course um, intended to replace A-levels for adults. But unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a lot of information out there on one, what it's like to take an Access course, and two, how to prepare for one. So I thought I'd try and fill the gaps in here. And that's the reason I wanted to make this video, because there isn't actually a lot of information for adults on how to prepare for their studies like this, because oftentimes most Access course students haven't ever taken any level three qualification before. So it's actually quite an intimidating path to take sometimes. So first on the list for preparation for me is finance. Very fortunately for me, I have never taken a level three qualification before. Therefore, the access course that I'm taking, which is access to medicine, will be free. And this goes for any other access course. If you haven't taken a level three qualification before, it will be free. However, for me, um, I still need to prepare and save. And that is because I have to move away to get my access course. So the one downside with access courses is that you don't necessarily get the one that you need for your preferred area of study in your area. So for me, where I live, there isn't any local access to medicine courses available to me. So I'm gonna to have to move out and rent a place in the town where there is a college that has the access to medicine course. So this for me has meant over the last seven or eight months, I have set up my own tutoring business on Fiverr to teach programming and all of that money that I've earned has been put into a savings account so that I can afford the rent that I need when I move out. And there is also one thing I need to add on to this as well. If you are having to move out and rent somewhere else to go to college for an access course, do remember that sometimes an access course is officially classified as a part-time course. Even though it is actually technically full-time, a lot of colleges list them as part-time courses and that might cause you some problems in getting a deduction or an exemption from your council tax. Where I stand with that at the moment, I don't know. I need to do some more research with the particular council that I'll be moving to, but at the moment it's looking a bit shaky, so make sure you do your research on, the, on that front as well. So the next thing on the list, of course, is the UCAT. So I'm starting preparation for this a little bit early, to be honest. Um, most people recommend six to eight weeks. But that being said, you know, for me, I'm not the most confident of people. So I like to pre prepare well ahead of time in little chunks just to sort of, you know, gain my confidence over time rather than just completely slam myself into something like that. So the exam can be booked from late July and I'm probably going to book my exam for somewhere in August to make sure that I've got, you know, the UK out of the way before the access course starts, which is something I recommend that everyone does who's taking an access course for medicine make sure you get that UCAT complete before you start. Because, you know, again, it comes back to intensity. You know, this is a level three course in nine months for medicine. This is gonna be highly intense. And the last thing you wanna be doing is adding UCAT on top of that as well. So of course, get into the meat of things now. The next and most important thing I am preparing for is the level three content. This will vary a lot for a lot of students. Don't worry if you're not doing this yet. This is just me, because again, I'm not the most confident of people and I like to prepare a lot. So I took a science GCSE a couple of years back and I also recently did some studies off of a um, chemistry GCSE textbook. And recently I've just been working on, you know, bringing all of those Anki flashcards back out and working on them again, just to get a very basic, you know, ground level knowledge in both chemistry and biology, just so that when I come back to it at A level, I'm not gonna be a complete stranger to it. Very important disclaimer here is that of course, the difference between level two chemistry and biology and level three chemistry and biology is absolutely vast. So you need to be very careful that you don't get into a full sense of security thinking, oh, this is fine, I'm doing level two stuff. Because from what I've heard, level three chemistry and biology is an order of magnitude higher in difficulty than level two. But, you know, it will help you train your fundamental skills. Like for instance, smaller ratios for me is a big problem. So studying at level two seems like a good idea because it's approachable and it's at an easier level than just being thrown into it at level three. One thing to bring up here though is that these are access courses. These are designed for people who haven't done science in years, and my tutor did reassure me um, on the open day a couple of years back that 
you know, the, the course is designed to make sure that people have all the fundamental skills they need to perform well in the course later on. But I'm not taking any chances here. I want to make sure that I'm prepared as I can be. So I'm probably going to do this now for the next month or two until August. And once I hit August, I'm going to start buying some A-level um, chemistry and biology books because that's more or less what you'll be revising from for the Access to Medicine course. And from there, I will be looking at the syllabus for the course which I'll include in the link down in the description so you can see, because it's now a standardized course, so every college, as far as I'm aware, has to use the same syllabus now, or the same course outline at least. What I'm going to do from there is I'm just going to sort of pick out all the topics that I think I might struggle with at the very beginning of the course, just to make sure that I'm, you know, ahead of the game when I enter the course. Because what I want to do is I want to sort of start the first couple of weeks on the course without too much stress, you know, I want to be able to know that I've got everything I need in my head to fully understand it, just to get me off to a good start. And then as well, it gives me a bit of buffer. So if I do fall behind at some point in class, it's not going to matter because I'll have studied like a chapter or two ahead of the actual classes. And the benefit of that is when I'm in a lecture that I can treat that time as reviewing rather than learning something new because I've already learnt it in the book or mostly in the book. So of course, the last thing on the list I'm preparing for is the applications process. So unfortunately for Access to Medicine students, this can be quite a trial, mostly because it's very difficult to find universities that accept uh, Access to Medicine courses. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not like there aren't any at all. There are loads, but it's trying to find that information out, you know, trying to find a centralized list of, you know, access to medicine friendly universities is actually very difficult to do because there is, of course, the Medical Schools Council, I think, they have a PDF full of medical schools on there and people keep saying, oh yeah, you'll find the medical schools in there that accept access to medicine. But I've not found that. There are some universities in there that are listed there that don't actually mention access to medicine, that actually do accept access to medicine. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a pain. So I'm looking at all of my options and weighing them up and I'm making a list. So yeah, I'll be making sure that I find all the ones that I can apply for. And then of course, the next thing is work experience. Now, at the moment, again, I'm not 100% sure because the, the climate is now changing quite a bit, but I think medical schools are a little bit more lax on work experience at the moment, and this is mostly because, of course, of coronavirus, it's quite difficult to get any work experience at the moment because of that. So don't worry too much if you haven't got a lot of practical work experience at all. But myself, I have actually been doing some volunteering for a local um, autism organization, helping young adults become more independent. And I'll be using that as my work experience because I've, I've worked with them for over five years. So it seems like a really good thing to use in the statement. But don't worry, medical schools are fully aware that COVID has a very drastic impact on the ability to take work experience. So don't worry if you haven't got that yourself. And then, of course, there's also thinking about how your personal statement might look. For me, I think it's a little bit too early for me to start thinking about my personal statement. So I am actually going to, to save that for probably around August time. Um, once I've taken my UCAT, I'll probably start thinking about how I want to write my personal statement. Maybe that's a little bit too far ahead of time because on the course they do mention that they help you write your personal statement. But it would be nice to have some sort of a draft, just so I don't have to spend too much time trying to write that in the middle of a load of level 3 studying. So, summary then. Being prepared is very important at least in my view. Now, I think if you're a bit more confident than I am, you can probably afford to sort of leave it a couple more months and, and start preparing then. But for me, I kind of like to prepare little and often, you know, way before, because then I don't have to sort of spend really big chunks of time preparing right before something happens and then worrying about, you know, if I hit a roadblock or something, you know. The other point to this as well is that adult education can be very fickle. There's all sorts of problems that can occur along the way. So it's always very important to make sure that, you know, you've, you've got a lot of backup plans, you know because I'm fully aware that this path into medical school is very fragile. Anything could go wrong, you know, over the next couple of months. My UCAT could fail, you know, my grades could go badly wrong on the access course. I'm hoping they won't and they probably won't. But at the same time, these are very real possibilities. These things can happen. You know, life can happen and it can get in the way. Problems can occur. It's always very good to make sure you have your plan A's, your plan B's, your plan C's and your plan D's. You know, you want a lot of different plans to back you up throughout the process so that you don't get disheartened when things go wrong. So then at least you can just focus when plan A goes wrong, right, okay, on to plan B now. It's a very fast moving process, unfortunately. You don't get a lot of time to think, which is why I think it's very good to plan ahead. And then of course, there's also the importance of keeping in mind the intensity of this course. Do not underestimate how intense this will probably end up being. 
I have talked to people that have said before that the access course was actually more intense than going into medical school. I think it's worth taking into account because it is going to be a very intense period of your life. So never underestimate that, which again is why it's so important to be prepared to make sure that you know, you're know you making it as effortless as possible to get everything that you need to get done, done. And then of course, I really want to underline this bit, make sure you have a good list of all the medical schools that will take you. Account for all the different eventualities that could come out of it. You know, take a look at you know, medical schools that will offer places to access students who score lower in their access course and low on the UCAT. You know, get a good combination just so that when you do apply, depending on what happens with your UCAT and your access course, you know which ones are good to put for your firm and your insurance and all that good stuff. Anyway, that's it for today's video. Thanks very much for watching and I will see you soon with more content.